there was an entrepreneurial spirit in China that there wasn't in Russia. Like the Russians had been too beaten down and they didn't know how to, to think like business people. The 21st century, Jim Rogers and others would say, it's going to belong to Asia. He said, you know, in 2000, if you're smart, you move to Asia. But I think as we get deeper into the 21st century, people say, hey, again, maybe China's played out and maybe that has an impact around Asia. Uh, does the, the latter half of the century belong to Africa? And maybe tell me more of what the people that you're talking to are doing and what they're investing in real economies in Africa. I do think there is possibly a very reasonable way to look at the world is that Asia, in particular, China was suppressed for a very long time, like just with terrible government policies and an economy that boomed hundreds of years ago and then, uh, you know, was suppressed for a very long time. And then once the weight was taken off of it, there was this huge entrepreneurial thing that happened. And actually, in, in Jim's book, Investment Biker, he talks about that. Like, it's the story that he, he rode his motorcycle around the world and he first drove through Russia and then he drove through China. And of course, both of them were kind of communist countries at the end of communism. And he just said there was an entrepreneurial spirit in China that there wasn't in Russia. Like the Russians had been too beaten down and they didn't know how to, to think like business people while the Chinese were hustling and making smart decisions. And they were kind of being held back by communism, but they were an entrepreneurial people. I, I think there is an argument just that in the very long run, you know, if people are allowed to, to work and to thrive, that in a way, the country with the greatest factors of production should probably be the largest economy. And one of the big factors of production is just people, people. workers. And, you know, China just has this huge China, population. India, Indonesia, Nigeria as well in Africa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think if you... You know, may maybe that's an overly simplistic way of looking at it. But if you wanted to say, like, in a hundred years time, um, you know, where will stuff be coming from? Where will exciting businesses be happening? Well, the answer probably is where there are people who are doing stuff. They're a lot stuff, younger. So. I mean, you're, gonna, you're seeing population declines. Talk about uh, what you think with BRICS and, and what's going on. New countries are joining. Others want to join. My concern is some folks say, ah, you know, who cares about these little countries? I, I think it becomes something over time. What do you think? You see, the, my problem with, with BRICS is that it's sort of a made-up construct to start with. Like, the term BRICS just yeah. came from a guy at Goldman Sachs who kind of lumped together a few... And then they just kind of adopted it. Yeah, and then they suddenly decided we are a thing like the EU or something. But right. it's like... But they have no, like, cultural connection. Many of them... You know, the biggest two countries in there, China and India, can't stand each other and have daily border disputes, you know? And the, the, and then, yeah, there's all these other countries who sort of say they want to join. And of course, Putin is kind of pounding the table that this is the future, but it's because it's the only people who will trade with him at the moment, right? But the problem with BRICS as, as a, a, an economic construct is that China is so much, so, so, so much bigger than everything else in there that basically if you were to team, you know, it's sort of... Um, you know, like Argentina teaming up with China. It's like you, you're just a, a subsidiary of China at that point. None of these countries want to be that, right? Like, there's no way. Isn't it good to have an option, though? I mean, I know here in Malaysia, there's prime ministers who talked about, we were always with the U.S., and we still share some values with the U.S., but they take us for granted. They don't do much. Like, wh why are we just a rubber stamp for them? You don't have to lock yourself into, yeah. like, an economic group either. Like, and, and actually... In the real world, like there's people want to talk about BRICS, but if you look at what India is, India is a great example. You know, India will trade with China, they'll trade with the Russians, they definitely will trade with the United States, and they're being smart and sitting on the fence, right? Like they kind of say, they sort of do their best to kind of go, you know, you guys have your fights, we won't get involved, we'll buy and sell stuff uh, from you guys, and we'll, we'll try not to get anyone too upset with us. And I think that's really, all of these countries want to do that. Like they'll, they'll talk a big game about, you know, this new order that's likely to come about. But if you think about it, like if you, we'll say if you're a small country and you're, you're going to like really tie your bow to a bigger country, which you, you don't have to do, but we'll say if you decided to, 
and your options are China or the United States, who's going to stomp down on you more is kind of the question. And I would argue that maybe China, will, you know, China will stomp down on their own citizens. How are they going to treat, you know, the, the sort of people of a small country who's decided that they're now buddies with, with China? You know, it, it's equally, you know, I, 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 I'm not so sure that the United States would be that generous to it. To I'm a small not convinced country. that they are. No, no, I, you know, like just to be clear, because often when I whenever I speak about something and I kind of say, well, you know, something about China, people kind of go, well, you didn't bring up the United States. It's like, no, because I wasn't talking about that. Yeah, but, the what about yeah. it is good old. I, I thought one of the best lines from the Trump presidency was he did that interview and he's like, what do you think our people are so innocent? We're so innocent. I, I thought it was high time someone someone said that. I mean, look, look at, look at, let me just take a look at Cuba and look at how they're complaining that Cuba's now teaming up with China. They tried to bring Cuba more to the fold and then they undid it. And it's like, well, what, what are you supposed to do? I, and, I, and I kind of, for that reason, I say, I'm glad for optionality. I think in the real world, all of these countries are and will pursue that optionality, where they'll tell everyone sure. that they want to be friends with them and we'll join this group and we'll join that group. But when push comes to shove, they'll look after themselves, oh, sure. which is the only sensible thing to do. And so I think... Any like really big arguments about these countries clubbing up together and uh, you know sort of a new order generated from that? So you I, think I India think is a success like, story, perhaps, but the BRICS thing you think is overblown? Yeah, I I just don't think that these countries have any real. I think that they're slightly joined together by nervousness about the behavior of the United States from time to time, or nervousness about being a small country in the world, and so you kind of think, well, gosh, if we could team up and sort of be part of an equal partnership, you know. But the problem is that there's very few really equal partnerships right. you can join up to, you know. So.